great so uh thank you very much guys um we uh, and thank you uh, thanks a lot for your quick introduction here let's start working on the very first module which talks about getting started with dynamics 365 for finance and operations uh to quickly talk about it what we are expecting uh, to be discussing in this particular module is a quick overview of the applications along with how do we start utilizing that so let's have a quick agenda what we are discussing in here we are talking about finance and operations functionality we are understanding the use of global address book how we should be utilizing that uh, navigation in finance and operations some of the features with operations and workspaces are new functionality in d365 and understanding that dynamics 365 finance and operations is completely compliance to gdpr uh, when it comes to um, uh, European countries down there and followed by that you would be having some hands-on labs associated with that so to quickly introduce you how we would be moving along with the program the very first thing I'm going to explain you the concept through these PowerPoint presentations then I would be giving you a practical demonstration down there by myself uh, step by step how to work and accomplish that particular task followed by we would be having a hands-on labs on the labs VM which the login details are provided to you already so at the same point of time the very first things and the second is going to be done by me where the hands-on lab needs to be completed by you now that's completely your choice you want to do it during the class or after the class hours the labs are available 24 by 7 for the next three days so you can have some of the hands-on associated with you great so let's start working with the very first thing which talks about the introductions having said that when i say uh, the quick introduction to dynamics 365 being an application or, or anything listed down there we are talking about what we would be covering in here so let's have a quick introduction when i say dynamics 365 finance and operations it's a microsoft erp solution for businesses and when i talk about dynamics 365 Two major areas where Microsoft is currently offering the solutions I've got the customer engagement I've got my ERP segment down there in, in terms of customer engagement that's my CRM the customer relationship management focused solutions down there which involve sales marketing customer service field service project service automation there are some talent onboarding and talent attract uh, possibilities are down there we've got the solutions down there when I talk about ERP segmentation down there I've got my Microsoft Dynamics 365 finance and operations we also have business central which is an upgraded version for Dynamics Navision down there I've got great planes for the small scale uh, industries down there I've got Dynamics 365 retail for the retail businesses also recently renamed as D365 commerce with lots of added functionalities down there so finance and operation belongs to the ERP suite of products provided by Microsoft at the same time when we talk about what different major applications can be in there so let's see we are talking about finance uh, it's pretty much for every organization finance is going to be the backbone in terms of managing day-to-day -day journals creating your cash and bank related transactions managing your accounts payables accounts receivables budgetings and all so that's all comes up as part of t365 finance at the same time We've got human resources slash talent over here d365 for uh, job applicants the job applications onboarding process attract processes down there that's what we have as part of that over here some of the industry verticals if we talk about I've got d365 retail down here I've got my manufacturing related modules whether it's my uh, production whether it's my uh, discrete manufacturing or lean manufacturing down there I've got D365 for public sector where we need to manage the fund uh, entities down there. We need to manage the pledges down there. We need to manage uh, pretty much uh, the public sector industries at the same time. We've got uh, the distribution, the supply chain foundation out there. We've got uh, industry add-on for service industries where you need to create and work on service orders down there. And when we talk about some of my horizontal workloads, whether it is my human capital management, 
whether it is my project service automation, whether we talk about our budget foundation, planning, creating and managing budgets down there, or whether we are talking about expense management, travel and expense management, we are talking about supplier relationship management, or we are considering our Salesforce automation by automating sales processes workflows down there. We are talking about customer cares, customer insights. We are talking about marketing automation. With the help of Dynamics 365, we can pretty much achieve all our horizontal and vertical workloads providing how, how we start working and how we utilize these applications in our plant production environment down there. At the same point of time, when we talk about some of the quick overview related details that how the global address book works, how do we start utilizing them? So when I talk about Dynamics 365, there is a concept of what is a global address book uh, how that actually works into the system and how we should be planning them and utilizing them. We'll be having a demonstration of this navigational overview as well. The important thing to discuss, it is not a feature which is something new which Microsoft just introduced. No, that's available from very long time. It's been there for since AX version 4.0. Then uh, Microsoft with the evolution of every release, whether it's 2009, 2012, R2, R3, AX7 or the latest D365 finance and operations. Microsoft continue to enhance that with some add-on functionalities down there. So it's important to understand what is our global address book, how we should be planning that, and how we should be utilizing that. Having said that, let's take an example of the navigation and discussion, discussion on the global address book down there. So for that, I'm taking you to my browser over here. Important thing, I'm already connected to my westcoast.gtechlearn.com. Uh, to quickly give you a small heads up here guys, I was seeing some of the chats where people were facing troubling accessing to the labs. So let me click on logout over here. I'm showing you again step by step how would you be logging to the labs. Right now you don't need to do anything. You'd be doing hands on when we would be discussing the lab accesses and you'll be assigned a lab down there to work on this application. So right now I'm at westcoast.gtechlearn.com. Important thing, I'm over HTTPS, so that's completely secured over browser. Once you reach us to that particular URL, the details what you received from me probably over the email will have a couple of username passwords. It might be confusing to you, but let me make it clear. Uh, the very first authentication is the portal level authentication for RDP. So the very first thing I'm giving over here on this Guacamole portal is the credentials, which is equal for all of us, for everybody in the class is following the same credentials. And that is events-mb300 at gtechlearn.com with the password, uh, whatever's mentioned over the email down there. Now, when I specify and click on login, that will give me just a second. Let me have the password DHE 59104. And the moment I click on login, it is going to take me to a secondary login page. This is where the credentials are different for every one of us. So for my case, I'm utilizing administrative login. For your case, you do have student underscore a unique number followed by a password what you'll be providing in here. So what I'm doing over there, I'm just writing my username. In your case, that's gonna be student underscore a unique number with your password listed down there. Let me quickly log in. The moment I log in, it will take me to this desktop where I'll be seeing the D365 home and the user details icon. We'll be verifying and we'll be discussing that this is an on-prem infrastructure and an environment. Uh, we can pretty much have a cloud hosted environment as well, a Azure hosted environment as well. We'll be discussing that when we'll be having LCS discussions later today. So for that, let me quickly open Dynamics 365 Home, the icon over here, which will take me to my default dashboard. And the moment I go in here, I'm giving you a very small navigational overview and what is a global address book, how we should be using it, what is the purpose behind that. So let me quickly have it listed over here. 
So for this one, you will notice I've got finance and operations on the top over here on the title bar. I've got the breadcrumb icon, which will give you access for the office applications. I've got a global search, which we would be discussing later in this demonstration. I've also got the name of the legal entity, which says DAT. Now, any of you, if you have any prior exposure with Dynamics, um, any of the version of Dynamics AX or D365, you know that's a legal entity, the list of legal entities down there. And every implementation does have this default company accounts data, which is that pretty much blank, nothing contains over here. For the purpose of demonstration, we have all the sample data listed over here in all these legal entities directly provided by Microsoft. So what I'm doing over here, for all of my demos and the labs, we would be utilizing USMF unless anything else is specified specifically on the lab guides. So I'm using the Contoso sample data. USMF is going to be my legal entity. And the moment you do that, your work workspace gets refreshed to reflect you the data which comes from USMF down there. Important thing in your case, guys, when you'll be having uh, the labs and everything, we would be having all these details associations and then having all those details listed. So at present, I've just changed the legal entity to be USMF over here. The next in the segment talks about the notifications, what different notifications we are getting. We'll be seeing them arriving over here. I've got some settings icon over here, which we will be discussing later today as well about the user options, what is task recorder, creating a mobile app, what we will be discussing module number five today. I've got some help and, uh, and support incidents. If it is linked to LCS, I can pretty much do these things right from there and followed by my logged in information with the user account I'm currently logged in over here. And that's one thing which is coming up on the title bar on the top as far as a small navigation is concerned. So very important thing for us and for you being when you will be practicing and please ensure whenever you're doing any demo or any lab, the first thing you should be doing is check that your current legal entity is USMF over here. If it is not, you can change it from here. We can set it the default startup legal entity as well. That is something we will be discussing a little later in the program. So let me quickly go in here. The next in the segment, if I click on this breadcrumb icon, the hamburger menu down there, you will see I've got the favorites area down here. I've got some of the recent uh, listings down here. I've got the modules in the workspaces. So you will see these four major things. No need to say that you can always dock them in if you want. You can pin the navigation pane over here or you can undock it if you want. That's completely on us. Now let's understand what these things contains. The most important thing being a technical or a functional consultant or an end user you might be working up is going to be the list of modules. Well, you might be wondering that what we are seeing over here. So pretty much we are seeing these details with all the modules and why all because currently I'm logged in as a system administrator role. Now, for you as well, being the students in the class, your login ID and password is already assigned into the system administrator's role. I'll explain you into the user's area and multiple things. So let's understand that. For example, if I click on my accounts receivable, as the name suggests, I'm gonna see the sub modules, the menu bars, the menu items over here, which would talk about the accounts receivables. At any point of time, you can expand them, you can collapse them, and pretty much how, how that's working, I'm clicking on expand or I'm clicking on collapse, I can go for individual expands right from there. So let's see if I would like to see the list of customers over here. I'm clicking on all customers and the list of all customers belongs to USMF will be available right across in here. So there we are when, when the list comes up and how does that works up in here. At the same point of time, guys, it is also important that if it is one of my most frequently visited place, I can always add it to my favorites. And that's where my first bar comes up. The moment I add it, the moment I make any menu item a favorite, you'll see that will start appearing over here. 
At the same time, if I go, let's say if I'm scrolling it down and I'm moving to my system administration area, on the users, I'm making that as a favorite, including the online users as well. So the good thing about that is at any point of time, you just click on to your favorites right over here and you will directly be in there in terms of how many online users are there, what are my current client session, where they are working, I can have all these details. So I can see a couple of you are already logged in over here with this particular MB3 events, MB3 user down there. Okay, that's fine. But that's not the demonstration. The demonstration was to tell you I've got the modules over here. I've got the workspaces, which we will be discussing a little later today. I've got the recent visited areas and I've got my favorites areas where I can add the menu items to be into the favorite mode. Next in the segment is I've got this content area, which will keep on changing depending on what we are navigating to. Great thing, one of the best feature I like a lot when we talk about this global search area where it says search for a page or anything. Now, uh, to be very specific about that, guys, uh, if I go very specific about this particular option down here, this is not which was not available in Dynamics. Of course, it was. If by chance, if any of you are aware about Microsoft Dynamics NAV, that is Navision, that feature was there. And with the evolution of AX7 or later renamed as D365 Finance and Operations, we started seeing that particular one. As far as my AX is concerned, that wasn't available in 2012 R3 or anywhere. So in D365, I've got this global search, which is really helpful. For example, being a functional consultant, I need to set up some payment terms or method of payments or posting profiles or PO defaults or, or warehouse setups related details over there. How we are traditionally, how we are structured to do that, we used to go to the list of modules, click on the list of module down there, then expand the setup area, go to the sub profiles and then find that particular option. Sometimes that could be very deep that finding that menu item can take a couple of seconds to a couple of minutes down there. To, to resolve it, the great thing here, if I'm talking about, let's say, payment terms down there, now I'm not specifying whether it is my forms or whether it is my uh, a list page or whether it is my report or whether it's anything. I just specified payment terms. And now you'll see wherever the payment terms menu items appears, it's completely visible to us and I can see that. For example, on my payment days, payment fee, and if I talk about payment calendar, if I talk about terms of payment, let's say I'm talking about method of payments, so that will search and will give me that where exactly the method of payments available in all these modules, whether it is your inventory management, whether it's your retail, whether it's your procurement or accounts receivable. So if I click on method of payments, it will directly take me there. So once again, it is a great functionality from the end user's perspective, but there is more to that. Uh, important thing, in spite of from the end user's perspective, it is also good from the perspective of a functional consultant where we used to find those menu items here and there in the application and we can directly get them have a search from right from there. Whether it's related to a form or anything, we'll discuss a lot more details about it. But let's come back to our original demonstration now. So if I take you back to my presentation, the original demonstration was about global address book. So let's see how does that work, what it is, and when we should be using it explicitly down there. So if I take you to my finance and operations labs interface, the very first thing, where do we find the global address book? Uh, that is same starting AX 4.0 all the way to D365 finance and operations latest platform build that will be available into the common area. So if I go into the common module, let me go to the common area down there and you will see my global address book listed over here. I've got something related to the setup as well where I can create multiple details. But at this point of time, let me click on my global address book. And as the name suggests, it is a global address book, depending on whatever type of parties you are, uh, I would find all those details listed here in the global address book. 
important thing about how does it work? How do we start utilizing that? So let's see something else. I'm on a different tab as of now. Important thing is I'm switching my uh, legal entity to USMF down there. Let me quickly do that. And just for the purpose of demonstration, let's see what I'm doing next. I'm trying to create a customer. And, and that's, not, that's not like I'm showing you how do we create a customer. It's just like for the sake of global address book and understanding it well, uh, why anybody should be using it. Uh, there is, the, if the need be, when we should be creating different uh, global address books down there. So let me create a new customer over here. And uh, the wizard appears in front of me for creating a new customer. Let me just call it GTL uh, CUS001, whatever I would like to name it. I can always automate it with number sequences. We'll be discussing that later today and tomorrow, um, my apologies. So let's go for XYZ Inc. for the demonstration purposes. As far as my customer group's concerned, I'm specifying the customer group is gonna be 10 over here. Uh, net payment terms, you can specify all these details. Uh, some of those are, are absolutely required. Some of those are optional. At this point of time, let me just say save and open. So I'm saving that customer and opening that, or maybe you can create that customer at any given point of time. So the purpose of that was I just created a customer in USMF legal entity, number one. Number two, that's in accounts receivable. I created a customer. Let me take you to the different tab where my global address book was listed. And here, if I'm searching anything related to XYZ, for example, Let's take a look guys. I'm seeing XYZ Inc over here and there is a party ID associated to that. We will discuss the roles and multiple things, but just to show you, uh, and when I talk about the listed relationships, is it related to a different party altogether? You would like to see the roles. If I open XYZ Inc from the global address book, we know very well, we created that as a customer. So if you scroll it down further, you will see the roles listed down here. And currently over here, there is gonna be one role. It is telling me that this particular party is a customer on this particular legal entity. And this is the customer number. Well, let's do it a couple of more times and, and try and understand that. So at the same point of time, whether it is a customer whether it is a vendor, whether it is a employee or a contractor, technically a worker, whether it is a job applicant, whether it's a lead, an opportunity, or whether it's a contact to, to anyone, they all will be a party down there. Important thing is, why I created that as a customer directly over here? Why not I created that as a party into my global address book first? So let's understand that. Whether it is a contact, customer, vendor, worker, prospect, applicant, competitor, any kind of categories, they would be always be available in your global address book to reduce duplicacy, to have the data deduplication in place down there. How does that help? Let's take a look. I'm creating a new party over here. Important thing, when I should be creating a party in my global address book, the thumb rule says, when I'm not sure what that particular person or party is gonna be, I'm not sure whether it's a customer or a vendor or anything, but that's gonna be something, then I should be creating them as a party. So let's take an example over here. I'm talking about here, uh, quick to hire, for example, with the search name, uh, whether the party is an organization or whether the party is a person, you can define all those values, have the address listed over here. So let me quickly save it real quick once. I've just saved it. Let me go down and add a address real quick to this particular party. And I'm just gonna do that. Let's go for official and I'm gonna specify the zip code down there, whatever we specify, and Alpharetta, Georgia, let me quickly quickly say yes. So important thing is I just added an address, I created a party. So first thing first, it is not a customer, it is not a vendor, it is not a worker either, but currently it is just a party. 
So for example, we got to know, hey, quick to hire is going to be a vendor for three of our legal entities. And instead of creating that vendor three times down there, well, I'm clicking on a vendor over here. So this party is going to be a vendor in my ERP system. Important thing for which legal entity, what's going to be the vendor account number and a vendor account group. So when I'm clicking on that, it automatically opens the vendor form. And let's say I'm going to say it's going to be vendor account number 20. And you will notice the names, all these values are automatically coming, including the address and all of the details. Well, let me just save it. I've just saved it over here. Let me quickly close and I'm changing my uh, organization. So let me close it first, taking myself back to the global address page where I'm on the party record over here, changing my legal entity to US retail. So let me go for USRT. I'm talking about the US retail. I'm switching to this particular legal entity once again. Since it is a global address book, which is shared with all of our legal entities, I'm once again searching for quick to hire down there. And the moment I do that, I'm seeing one over here. Now let's say this is also a vendor for our USRT. Let me click on the vendor once again over here. And I will be creating this time a vendor directly out of this party record but for USRT legal entity. So technically I'm not creating two different duplicated records. It's only one which is referred at two different legal entities. So let me just have my uh, USRT VN 67, whatever I would like to name it, uh, provided by my uh, vendor groups down there. So let me specify my vendor groups as service vendor for this legal entity. Let me just save it. So one thing I know, the party quick to hire is currently a vendor on two different legal entities. Okay. Well, one thing I also know that this particular quick to hire, if I click on a customer, let me click on the customer that may also be a customer on this particular legal entity as well as a supplier quite possible. So instead of duplicating that data, the global address book, just creating the references down here. So let me have my customer group selected as my internet customer, the address and everything comes up right across from there. And even if I change the address later on, on my party record, it's the changed address is going to reflect everywhere else. So that is the one thing guys, the, the sole purpose of introducing a global address book, was for the sake of data deduplication because we don't want to create thousands of duplicated customers and vendors right across in there. So that was the purpose of introducing a global address book. But at the same time, for example, if I'm on the global address book listed, I would like to create some sort of address books association or anything else. We can always do that and have those things listed. So if I show you something, let's say I'm on my quick to hire right over there. Let me open the quick to hire record, the party record, which I just did. And as part of my roles, let me expand those fast steps. I'm going to collapse them once. And in the roles right over here, you will see I've got vendor on USMF and USRD. I've got a customer on USRD, whether it's a prospect, whether it's a worker or a competitor, we can always get it created from here. So that's the very first thing. If I take you back uh, to a small concept in here, when we talk about a global address book, that's ideally how we should be treating that. Uh, we can have multiple global address books. So I would say most of the implementations goes with a single address book, having all those party records stored centrally for the entire organization. In some cases, your organization might want to create a different address book based on geographical regions. If I would like to restrict my data access specifically using XTS policies down there, or uh, I would like to do an address book based on my business functions could be an hybrid approach. So that is also possible down there. That was a very small demonstration, which was talking about what an a global address book is how we should be starting that, whether it's a party record and how we should be utilizing that at the same point of time. Now, 
Let's take an example over here, guys. When we move next to the segment uh, on the next uh, over here on the PowerPoint presentation, we talk about the navigation of our finance and operations. So when I say the navigation down there, let's see the very first thing it is introducing over here is our global search. As you can see that I've got my global search icon over here where I can see whether it is my form or whether it is my legal entity. I'm typing LE over there, uh, whether I'm directly typing for anything. So the purpose of having this, pro th this particular form over here, the PowerPoint presentation, if I take you back over here and in my global search, let's take an example. I'm talking about my posting profiles. Now, important thing is these posting profiles, whether they belong to your accounts payable or inventory or customer posting profiles or vendor posting profiles, you see them listed over here and start verifying and start creating right across from there. So this global search functionality is available and that's great specifically for the end users and the functional consultants down there. At the same time, when we talk about some of the workspaces, so this is something new um, and I, I can say that if you are aware about AX 2012 R2 or R3, one of the previous release down there, uh, there was a concept of role center pages. So there was a, a, a different a portal, which is known as EP, that's known as my enterprise portal. And uh, our developers and technical consultants used to create role center pages, profiles, and have the, the web part, SharePoint web parts, editable web parts over there, configure them and display information down there. So you can say that's quite similar, but it's completely different, redesigned in terms of HTML5 based access, uh, quick tiles over there. Uh, in, in MB500, in the developer course, people actually learn how to create and configure those workspaces and make them available to the application. So the important thing is how these workspaces are available into the application. Let's take an example. I'm moving over here to my demonstration portal, to my labs access, and first thing first, Let's say I'm at, at my home page. This is my default dashboard, which is what is appearing in front of me. Now, every module does have some workplaces associated with them. Let's say if it is my cash and bank management, you will see it, it's got three different workspaces over here. If you see my uh, credits and collections, I've got a customer credit and collection workspace down there. I can click and directly jump to that particular workspace. So these workspaces are aligned to different modules for different purposes, which is going to be a combination of some quick forms, tiles, and all those details listed over here. So let's take an example. It says I'm talking about USRT over here. Uh, if I've got some open activities, open cases, all these tiles. So if you are up here for a little bit of comparison, in, in our AX 2009 or 2012, we used to call them queues and queue groups uh, available over EP, showing me uh, the consolidated amount or number of entities or some of uh, a specific field down there. We call them tiles in the workspaces and D365 finance and operations. At the same time, if I go over here, I've got some charts over here uh, where I can see my charts, uh, uh, pretty much scroll them through by aging period definitions. Uh, let me change my legal entity to USMF down there and just wants to ensure I'm getting the data related to USMF over here. Well, the moment I do that, pretty much applying the filter and you will notice all these values are, are rapidly changing at the same time. So important thing, these are my workspaces over here. Important, a, a common question with everyone. Hey, that's great. Can I create my own workspace? Absolutely, yes. How do we do that? Well, we can always do that uh, with the help of a technical consultant or a developer. So it's actually MB500, a different program, which teaches how do you create your custom workspaces uh, through the portal, through Visual Studio, make them available wherever we want. Some of our workspaces will show you these analytics for all companies. Well, that's Power BI. I'll come down to that today on module number four when we will be discussing um, reporting capabilities down there. But at this point of time, 
I was talking about that my workspaces are available on every different module down there and there is a place where I can consolidatedly see all the available workspaces based on my security role. So whatever I have access to, you see I'm seeing all these workspaces over here. Let's take an example. What if I would like to go for my purchase order confirmation workspace? So I, I click on my PO confirmation and now you see I'm, I'm having my purchase order listed over here for review and all. You see all these details listed uh, for the confirmation tab. And let's, let's take an example of Northwind Traders, my vendor listed over here. If I've got any PO for review, awaiting actions. So the important thing is, depending on every different module, we've got these workspaces listed over here. Being a technical consultant or a developer, we can start creating, even customizing these existing workspaces if the need be. So as far as a navigational overview comes up over here, uh, there was like, I know what the favorites area is. Now I also know what is the recent tells me that my re most recent visited menu items. I know the workspaces area now. I also know the list of modules being available to me based on my security logs down there. At the same point of time, this is my content panel, which we will be discussing a lot during this training down there. So let me take you to my presentation here. We were talking about workspaces, a combination of uh, uh, quick tiles over here, a combination of quick view forms, combination of charts across the line down there. We do have these workspaces associated with our application. Now, Microsoft comes up with more than 75 different workspaces out of the box and on top of it, you can create unlimited number of workspaces and you can customize the existing ones as well. Okay, the next in the segment, it's quickly a very a quick slide over here, but just to tell you that GDPR specifically when, you, when you're implementing anything inside European Union, one of the stringent set of rules needs to be followed is your uh, GDPR, your global data protection regulations down there. And just to tell you that our D365 finance and operations is completely compliant when it comes to our GDPR regulations following up all those values down there. So that was the very first module guys. This module was a little bit talking about how do we work with our navigational overview down there. Now, based on this, you've got a very small single module exercise that will talk about creating and configuring a, a address book. If you need to create a new address book specifically for a different region down there, you'll be doing that over here. For this one, I've, I'll be providing you a URL. That URL will give you access to another PDF. That PDF contains the steps of how you would be using the global address book at the same time. So let me just have it over here. The moment you will be clicking on that, let me show you that first and then you guys can start working. So this is a practice lab. Every practice lab does have some exercises over here and they give you a scenario that what you would be doing over here and that gives you the steps, some of the unique steps over here. So you would be following these 15, 16 different steps over here for configuring an address book guys. But just to let you know, uh, one thing you should be aware of that we all are working on a shared lab in our regular trainings that used to be a dedicated lab over there. So you do have the lab access with you. Once you have this lab downloaded, important thing when you will be doing in the name field, you, you need to enter ROM store and then I've made it a little bit easy to do. You should be putting up your unique first name, last name, or maybe your student number with the same student number you're logging in. So you will know these are your configurations, your records, what you created over there. So that's one thing what we have over here. Now, important thing to everybody, we did provide the sandbox credentials to everyone in the class. Just in case if you guys haven't received any, any um, credentials that the email should come up directly from me, but just in case if you don't have it, feel free to pass on your details to support at gtechlearn.com and uh, I'll, I'll, they'll be happily provide you the, the, the lab access for this. So for all the people who does have the lab accesses, now you can download this PDF as your very first exercise. Let's configure this global address book. That's gonna be 15 different steps. And once we are done with that, we will proceed further. 
So let's say a quick 10 minutes where you'll be able to complete this lab and then we shall proceed further. So let's have a quick 10 minutes here. I'll keep the counter running, a countdown running. And after 10 minutes, we will proceed with our second module for the day.